men and women grow up in different cultures, and as a result of growing up in these different cultures, we learn different lessons about appropriate adult behavior. We learn different lessons about what it means to be a leader. We learn different lessons about what it means to be a member of a team. And the hitch is, though, that these lessons, these cultures, are typically invisible to us. We don't see them. It's not an issue of right or wrong or good or bad. It's just invisible to us. So we have these very different rules about how we're supposed to behave. So let's talk about how they play out in terms of leadership. In a hierarchy, the leadership style that works most effectively is command and control. The person up here tells the person down there to do it, and they do it without question. In a flat structure, the leadership style that works most effectively is involvement. Now the issue isn't which of these is the correct way to lead. They are both correct. They are just correct at different times. Command and control works most effectively in time-bound situations when there is no alternative. The government says we have to, and we can talk about it to our blue in the face, but we'll have to do it that way. And when, and when in, we're in emergency situations. Involvement works most effectively when you need creativity, when you need psychological buy-in, and when you need them to make it work. But the hitch is we tend to go on automatic pilot and use the style that's most comfortable for us, the one that we grew up with, rather than the one that is most functional in that situation. Now, I was talking about this a couple years ago to 150 men in Kansas City. And one of them said, Pat, Pat, are you saying that Mike Ditka should use involvement? Is that what you're saying, Pat? Now, unfortunately, I had to say, who's Mike Ditka? <laughs> and I think I lost some major points with this group. But I quickly learned that he was, at that time, the coach of the Chicago Bears. And, and that is a classic time-bound situation. Before the next play, he can't get together the guys in the huddle and say, OK, I'd like to get your opinion. We'll start with you and go around the circle. That is, that is not what works in a time-bound situation. So the key here is to understand what works in this particular situation in terms of the leadership needs. Now, one of the things that ties in here to leadership is the issue of power. In our culture, we define power and masculinity as almost synonymous. We define power and femininity as very different kinds of critters. So it is easy for a man to be powerful and masculine at the same time, but it can often be difficult for a woman to be powerful and feminine at the same time. Now, let me give you an example of this. During the last presidential campaign, one of the candidates was speaking to a group of reporters during a press conference. And these reporters were really grilling this candidate. And one of the reporters was a woman. As the candidate left that press conference, he said to the person that he was working with, he didn't realize his microphone was still on, he said to the person he was working, walking with, he said, what was she trying to do, prove her manhood? Now here's her dilemma. If she wants to be a member of this reporter group, she has to ask the tough questions. But what happens is, oftentimes when women ask those tough questions, they get zapped with comments like, what are you trying to do, prove your manhood? So what happens is women get caught in a double bind in a way that men don't when it comes to leadership. Now, let me give you what the research is on this. This is some research done by the Center for Creative Leadership, which does wonderful research. And what they found is for both men and women leaders to be effective, one must be aggressive. But men can display aggressiveness in a wide variety of ways. Women must be aggressive, but within a narrow band of acceptable behavior. And if she gets out of this narrow band of acceptable behavior, she is called? Yeah, yeah, you got it. So here's the dilemma. Here's the dilemma. A woman cannot simply look at her male colleague and say, he talks this way, he behaves this way, he does these things, it works for him, so I'll do it. Because women are judged by women's rules. Both men and women judge women by women's rules. Now let's talk about being a team player. If I were to say to you, are you a team player? I'd say, oh yeah. Do you want to work with people who are team players? I'd say, oh yeah. The hitch here is that men, when men and women are talking about being a team player, they're talking about radically different ideas. Now let me give you an example of this. I was doing a team building session with some executives of a company, and I had given them the assignment in small groups of identifying their role and responsibility as a member of the senior management team. And they had to put their results up on flip chart paper. And the first group gets up to report out, and their spokesperson is Bill. Number one on their list is be a team player. So I said to Bill, what does that mean? And he said, it means to follow orders, to support unquestioningly, and do what needs to be done, even if you don't want to. 
So we went through the rest of their list. We went to the next group, and their spokesperson was Melinda, Bill's boss. So I said to Melinda, because number one on their list was be a team player. I said to Melinda, what does that mean? And she said it means to share ideas, to listen to each other, particularly when we disagree, and to work together collaboratively. Now, both of these individuals were using exactly the same term to talk about radically different ideas. As he sees it, being a good team player means knowing your slot on the hierarchy and playing your slot well without question. To her, being a good team player means helping out anybody you can on this flat field in any way that you can. So then I went back to him and I said, how does her definition strike you? And he said, manipulative. I went to her and I said, how does his definition strike you? And she said, mindless. <laughs> now, here's what happens. Today, more than ever, we are working with people on teams. And we start pointing the finger. You're not a team player. You're not a team player. You're not a team player. Without understanding what often drives this problem is that we define that word differently based on the cultures that we come from. And now when I do team building with groups, I will not let them talk about who's a team player, you're not a team player. They have to define the behavior that they're getting or not getting that's a problem for them because the term gets in our way. Now, one of the things that's related to this is the issue of friendliness and friendship. In the work setting, women are more likely to have friendships. If you're my friend, you're my friend in good times and in bad, in a professional life and in a personal life. If you're my friend, you're my friend, period. Men, on the other hand, are more likely to have friendliness. Friendliness comes and goes as needed. One time when I was doing a workshop on this, I, at the beginning of the workshop, I had the men tell us the lessons of childhood. And one man said, loyalty, loyalty to the team. I said, well, what if you get traded? Loyalty to the new team. <laughs> now, that's, that's friendliness. Comes and goes as needed. Now, here's how this then plays out in terms of uh, the work setting. Here's this man and this woman who are good buds at work, stop by each, other, each other's area, tell each other jokes. They go into the meeting, and in the meeting, he rips her ideas to shreds. And as they're walking out of the meeting, he says to her, don't take it personally. This makes no sense to her. Now, what has happened here? To him, this meeting was like a scrimmage. We went in, we had the scrimmage. And now that the meeting is over, our relationship, just like a rubber band, can bounce right back to where it was before. Fat chance. <laughs> because to her, he has violated the friendship. And she will never trust him again. Now, the hitch here is they had two different kinds of relationships, and they didn't know it. And it's that invisibility that creates so many problems for us. Now, let's talk specifically about meetings and how we do meetings differently. One of the things about meetings in terms of what men do is men tend to speak at length, and women tend to speak briefly. Now, let's talk about what's behind this. Uh, we're having a meeting on Wednesday to discuss problems related to Project X. And I'm a man, and I've got, this, I've got some great solution. I've got a great solution to these problems. So what I'm going to try to do as a way of showing you how much I believe in my ideas is I'm going to try to dominate the meeting with the discussion of my idea. So I put my idea on the table, and John brings up his idea. I bring my idea back, Sam brings up his idea. I bring my idea back, Mary brings up her idea. I keep bringing my idea back as a way of showing you how much I believe in this idea. On the other hand, a word that girls are brought up with is the word share, share. So what a woman is likely to do unconsciously is to calculate, okay, there's five of us here in the meeting. That means I get about 20% of the airtime. I will take my 20% of the airtime, then shut up. She looks at his meeting behavior and says, what a hog. He looks at her meeting behavior and says, doesn't much care about her ideas. Now let me give you an example of how this plays out in real life doing work with one of the big six accounting firms that has tremendous gender problems. And among their gender problems is, although they hire 50-50 men and women at entry, when they look at their top 1,400 people, top 1,400, only 3% are women. And they can't figure out what's happening between the 50% and the 3%. So one of the things they did is they went back and they looked at men's and women's performance appraisals and found that one of the phrases that shows up on women's performance appraisals, but not on men's, is the phrase, she does not speak up in the meetings. My question to them was, through the lens of whose culture? Through the lens of the culture that says, if you really believe in your idea, you dominate the meeting with a discussion of your idea? Or through the lens of the culture that says, you take your fair share of the airtime, then shut up. 
And again, it's because we have these different rules that we don't know that they get in our way. Some other differences in terms of how we do meetings are men are more likely to speak in a declamatory voice. Obviously, the best way to do it is. Women are more likely to phrase their ideas as questions. Don't you think it'd be a good idea if... So she sounds like a curious woman rather than a woman with ideas. Some other differences in terms of how we do meetings is men are more likely to interrupt and women to wait their turn. Now, if you just watch kids play, you'll see this. Watch a bunch of boys play first. What you'll see is they all climb on top of each other verbally. Just all climb on top, run, talking right on top of the other. Then watch a bunch of girls play. Girls do something that's called turn taking. I speak, I shut up, she speaks, she shuts up, I speak, I shut up, she speaks, she shuts up. And what happens in the meeting is the woman is waiting for the turn that never comes. And in fact, oftentimes to get heard in the meeting, she has to talk while somebody else is talking to interrupt, which is considered rude in her culture. And the women say, well, what, what do I do if I get interrupted? Here's what you do. You just keep talking. Here this voice comes in from over here. <laughs> you just keep talking. You don't make eye contact with the interrupter, interrupter. You don't raise or lower your voice. You just keep talking as if that voice does not even exist. Because what happens is women often give up the floor very easily, and then we wonder, how come I didn't get my say in the meeting? Another thing that women do in meetings is women smile more. In the research, this is called the silent applause. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that men do in meetings is that men resist being influenced, particularly in public. And that is why the meeting often does not happen in the meeting. The meeting happens before the meeting and after the meeting. But women often don't know this. Now, here's a scenario. We're having a meeting next Wednesday to discuss Project X. And what a man is more likely to do is to get his, as they say, ducks lined up before the meeting. Uh, George, I was thinking about bringing this up in the meeting. I think it would be real helpful to you. And these guys, same, I was thinking about bringing this up in the meeting. I think it would be helpful to you. Uh, Harry, here, here I was thinking about And by the time the meeting occurs, the meeting has already occurred. But women often don't know this. And here's a, here's a place that you can physically see this. Next time you get your hands on a conference schedule that, for a conference that is dominated by men, and your hands on a conference schedule for conferences dominated by women, compare the schedules. For instance, hospital administration conferences, which are 96% male, and nursing administration conferences, which are 97% female. Just compare the schedules. The nursing conference will start at 8 o'clock in the morning with pre-registration at 7.30. We'll go nonstop till noon, break for an hour at lunch, and go nonstop till 5 or 5.30. The hospital administration conference will start about 9, 9.30 in the morning so there can be a duck lining up breakfast. We'll break for a two hour lunch for more duck lining up. We'll break again in the afternoon for golf for more duck lining up, followed by a cocktail party in the evening for more duck lining up. And see what happens is women get a hold of this schedule and we go, well see these guys go to this thing and they, they just fool around. But what women don't understand is those, those breaks are built in there. They are functional because that is where the meeting is really occurring. And if she doesn't participate in that, she often will not have any influence in the group. And I was talking about this at the Department of Energy um, conference in Oklahoma. And this one fellow, he said, well, of course the meeting doesn't happen in the meeting. He said, you can disagree with me before the meeting. You can disagree with me during the break. You can disagree with me after the meeting, but don't disagree with me before the meeting. That's, um, during the meeting. He said, that's just a waste of time. He said, it's obvious. So I went over to this woman and I said, well, how does it seem to you? And she said, it's slimy. It's political. Now, the issue isn't which of these is the right way. But here's the thing. We, we have these different sets of rules and we've got to agree on them. Are we going to have the meeting before and after the meeting? Are we going to have the meeting during the meeting? Let's decide on which way we're going to do it make the decision overt so that we're all playing by the same rules. Now, now let's talk about how we talk differently. This uh, first lesson in terms of how we talk differently was a major lesson for me, the issue of making it up. Here's how I learned this. I was having dinner one night with one of the ranking women in corporate America. And I said to her during dinner, I said, how did you get to where you are today? And she said, well, first five years I was unconscious. I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, there I was, a brand new Harvard MBA, and people sort of came at me as if I should have answers. I thought they wanted me to take out my calculator and tell them the way the world works, and I didn't know the way the world works. I said, so what'd you do? She said, I hid for five years so the people would not ask me questions to which I did not have answers. I said, well, then what happened? She said, one day, 
I woke up and I realized that all those men were making up the answers. <laughs> and if they could make up the answers, I could make up the answers. And once I started making up the answers, promotions came one after another. Now here's the scenario. New project coming down. We've never done a project like this before. So they go, in fact, we're not sure anybody in the field, in the industry has done a project like this. So they go to the woman and they say, if we gave you this project, what would you do? Whoa, I've never done anything like this. Um, I suppose we could try A, but I'm not sure that A would work. Um, if A doesn't work, I guess we can try B. Boy, I've never even seen anything like this. Um, if B doesn't work, I suppose we could try C, but to be perfectly honest, I'm just not sure. So they go to the man. New project coming down. If you gave her this project, what would you do? I think it's pretty obvious. <laughs> we do A. If A doesn't work, we do B. If B doesn't work, we do C. Clearly. Now, does he know any more than she does? No. What women do is what I call going into the confessional. <laughs> Before I give you any of my ideas, I want you to understand the depths of my ignorance. <laughs> and only when you understand everything I don't know will I feel comfortable telling you what I do know. Now, why do we do this differently? For women, this is an issue of honesty. You're looking at buying me, and I want to be honest with you about what you'd be getting if you bought me. For men, this is an issue of risk. I'll tell them I can do it and then see if I can figure out how to do it. <laughs> but what happens is, who are you going to buy? Now, let me give you an example of this that happened to me recently. I was speaking at the Oklahoma Hospital Association. I was supposed to start at 9 o'clock. It's 5 minutes to 9, hanging around the front of the room. And this guy walks in the front of the room towards me. And I'm thinking, I know this guy. Where do I know this guy from? When he got halfway towards me, I realized he was somebody that I had hired 10 years ago in California. And when I hired him 10 years ago, he was 23 years old. He was just finishing his bachelor's degree in political science, and he was working as a grunt in the local hospital. And as he walks towards me, I see that his name tag says, CEO, big hospital. <laughs> and I was, uh, my first reaction was, whose name tag have you got on? <laughs> and I could not believe this was his name tag. And bless his heart, he took me to the airport, and we talked. And I said, how did you get in this position? And he said, well, before I was in this position, I was the chief financial officer of a big hospital in Florida. And I said, you could not have been. And he said, Pat, he said, Pat, you know, Pat, you know that I have had three days of financial training. You know it because you organized it, but they didn't know it. And I figured I knew enough people who had the answers who I could call or I could make them up. And I said, give me an example. And he said, well, one day the people from the corporate, uh, corporate office is called. They wanted the numbers for the five-year strategic plan. I just made them up as fast as I could. He said, you know, in five years, everything will have changed, and they won't know if the numbers are right to begin with. And he's right. <laughs> he is absolutely right. Now, another way that we learn to speak differently is how we talk about success and failure. Now, this study has been replicated many times, many ways, been done with children, and it has the same results. And what they did initially is they got a big group of men and women together, arbitrarily divided them in half and gave them a thing to do. Then they gave them bogus results. They told one half of the group, ooh, you did particularly well, and asked them why. They told the other half of the group, ooh, you did particularly poorly, and asked them why. When men were asked why they did particularly well, they attributed it to themselves. Well, you asked me to do it, didn't you? When women were asked why they did particularly well, they attributed it to effort, task ease, or luck. I tried real hard. It wasn't hard to begin with, or I got lucky. When asked why they failed, men attribute to factors outside themselves. Well, you didn't give me enough time. When women were asked why they failed, they attributed it to themselves. I tried. I just couldn't do it. Now, I want you to get these dynamics. Men succeed, point inward. Men fail, point outward. Women succeed, point outward. Women fail, point inward. And somebody sent me a cartoon which I thought captured this very well. The first frame was of a woman standing in front of a mirror trying to get her pants zipped up. And her caption said, I got to go on a diet. Second frame was of a man standing in front of a mirror trying to get his pants zipped up. And his caption said, something's wrong with these pants. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd like you to look at is where you point the finger when you succeed and fail. Now, let me talk about how we, we speak differently. A uh, study was done looking at applicants to an MBA program. And in applying to this program, people had to write an essay about their future. Now, you tell me. Men begin their essays with, I, what would you guess? 
I will. Women begin their essays with I hope to or would like to. Now you are on the selection committee. Are you going to choose the person who will do it or the person who hopes to do it? <laughs> yeah, the will and the will. Now does he know any more than she does he's going to pull that off? No. He made that up and she went into the confessional. But you may say, how on earth could we have learned to speak differently? We grew up in the same families, eating the same food, sitting in the same classrooms. But it's even in the Boy Scout and Girl Scout oath. So let's first visit the Boy Scout oath. For those of you who know the Boy Scout oath, on my honor, what? I promise. I will do my best. OK. Girl Scout oath, on my honor, I will try. That's all I commit to is a try. Once I have tried, I have done enough. So in many subtle ways, we teach children how to speak differently. So let me talk about some of the things that we do linguistically differently. One of the things that women do is, at the beginning of sentences, women use phrases that are called disclaimers. Disclaimers are phrases such as, I'm not sure about this, however, or this may be a stupid idea, but. Now, men often hear these disclaimers as saying, get ready for stupidity. This is virtually worthless, and I want to warn you right up front. Second thing that women do linguistically are women use words that are called hedges. Hedges are words like sort of, maybe, could be a little bit, perhaps, kind of, try. And when she sort of talks of this, she perhaps doesn't kind of sound like she knows what she's talking about. Maybe. <laughs> Third thing that women do linguistically, at the end of sentences, women use words that are called tag questions. And tag questions are phrases such as, I believe this is the best way to do it. OK? <laughs> we need to do it this way. You know? And this little question at the end of the sentence is often heard by men as, I need your assurance. I don't really know what I'm doing. Now, why would women use hedges, disclaimers, and tag questions? It's that old flat structure. Because if I'm working with, what's your name? Tony. If I'm working with Tony, and I go into her, and I say, Tony, we will be doing this on Tuesday in this way. This is not going to work. <laughs> so what I have to do is to flatten that baby out linguistically. So how I might do this is to go in and say, Tony, I was thinking we might be do this on Tuesday. What do you think? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> now what I have done here is I have linguistically involved her in the process. So this linguistic involvement is very functional in the female culture. But I go and I say the same thing to my male colleague, and he thinks, I have gotten stuck with a woman who can't find her way out of a paper bag. <laughs> so what works in one culture will often backfire on you in the other culture. And as we talked about, we need to change our behavior oftentimes as we go from culture to culture to be successful in that culture. Now let me talk about one of the things that men do linguistically. It's called verbal bantering. It's very important in the male culture. It's one of the ways that boys bond, tell each other they like each other, and negotiate position in the hierarchy. It can be very significant with women because women don't grow up doing this and will often hear it differently than it's intended. Now, let me give you an example of this. I was sitting next to a fellow on a TWA flight one day. And he had a TWA uniform on. And I would guess he was probably in his mid-50s. And we had talked a little bit about the industry. And then I said, are you a pilot? And he said, no, my mother just dresses me this way. <laughs> Whoa! I had almost a split-screen reaction. Half of me is going, crime buster, that was a fair question. Why are you being so mean to me? I don't deserve this. And then half of me is going, oh, this is verbal bantering. I get to practice it sitting right here in the airplane seat. <laughs> so from this side, not my real side, but from this side, I said to him, this may surprise you, but I can't tell the difference among gate agents, flight attendants, and pilots. I'm sure you're wearing something that indicates you're a pilot that's real important to you, but I haven't a clue what it is. <laughs> oh. It seems so vicious to say, but his reaction was, oh, yes, see, I've got these stripes right here. <laughs> took on his hat, took me on a tour of his hat, and we had bonded. <laughs> if you have young sons, you have seen this behavior. What boys will do is they'll go up to their best friend and they'll say, you look like a frog. You look like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. This means I like you a whole lot. <laughs> but see, girls would never go up to their best friend and say, Tony, you look like a frog. <laughs> this would not enhance the relationship. Now, here's how this becomes a problem on a team. It's talking to a woman who had just gotten promoted to the executive rank. She's the first woman at this level, so obviously all of her peers are male. And she said, I hate it. I hate them. I can't stand it. I'm in misery. I said, well, give me an example of what's going on. 
And she said, okay, let me tell you. Every Monday morning we have a meeting. And even before this meeting gets started, these guys start ripping each other to shreds. They are so vicious. They are so nasty. And now, and now, they're starting to do it to me. And I said, this is good news. <laughs> because what's happening here is before the meeting, they're doing the verbal bantering, bantering, the bonding behavior. And now they're starting to include her in the bonding behavior. But she doesn't see it in inclusion and bonding behavior because she reads it through the rules of her culture and reads it incorrectly. So again, we have to understand how the other culture works if we're going to work together effectively on teams. Now, let me share with you some of the things that we do different non-verbally. Uh, a study that just came out recently looked at how men and women's heads behave differently, their brains behave differently, when they're sensing nonverbal cues. And what they did is they put people in a PET scanner. You may have seen PET scanners. You put the brain in there, and the color tells you what's happening. The part of the brain that's real active turns red. The part of the brain that isn't doing anything turns blue and all the colors in between. What they did is they first put women in the PET scanner and then showed them a series of pictures of facial expressions, happy, sad, angry, disgusted, and so forth, and asked them to identify the emotion in the picture. When women are in the scanner doing this activity, there's this little red crescent that shows up right here, and the rest of the brain isn't doing anything. Put men in the scanner, show them the same series of pictures, whole thing turns red, and they don't get the answers right. <laughs> now, we know from lots and lots of research that there's a big difference in nonverbal sensitivity when it comes to men and women. But here's how it becomes a problem. I'm unhappy, what's your name? Harry. I'm unhappy with Harry. He's, a, he's my uh, colleague at work, but rather than tell him directly, I go up and I put my sad face in his face. And I expect that he's going to pick up on the fact that, uh, you know, something's wrong. But to Harry, this face looks like every other face. He, it doesn't look any different to him, so he doesn't say anything about it to me. Now I get even more ticked off. He's ignoring the fact that I'm unhappy. He doesn't even care about it. When in reality, he just didn't see it because of the difference in nonverbal sensitivity. Now, let me talk about what we do differently with our face. Boys grow up being told over and over that big boys don't cry. And it actually goes a step beyond that in that boys learn to mask emotion in general. I am really hurt that the coach isn't paying any attention to me, but I would never display that because then I would look like a weak player. Girls, on the other hand, grew up doing a lot of what's called face work. Well, hi, how are you? It's so nice to see you. Glad to be here. It's really nice to see you again. <laughs> now, here's what happens. She goes in to talk to her male colleague, and, and he's sitting there. He's got his stone face on, and she thinks, what a cold, calculating critter. Never can trust this guy. Doesn't feel comfortable about the interaction. He, he's watching her do all this face work. She's not trying to make it better by doing all this face work. And what happens is he thinks, what's wrong with that face? <laughs> now, again, what works in one culture doesn't work in the other culture. And if we don't understand the different rules, we're going to have problems. Now, let me talk about what we do with our bodies. Can I borrow your body, Harry? Come here a second. Okay. When women interact with women, women interact facing each other directly straight on. When men interact with men, Men interact shoulder to shoulder and talk out here. So what happens when we're interacting with the other gender, we try to get it fixed up. Fixed up is my way. So Harry, Harry and I are in the hallway at work talking. And this doesn't feel comfortable to me. So what I try to do is I try to get in his face, and he turns around. I try to get in his face, and he turns around. And he turns around, and he turns around, and he turns around. And we leave this interaction, and he thinks, and he doesn't even know why he thinks this. But he thinks, what an aggressive woman. <laughs> and the reason he thinks that is that men only stand like this in aggressive situations. And the most aggressive posture between two men is facing each other directly with hands on the hips. You often see this on the front of the sports page. <laughs> now, on the flip side of what happens here, Harry and I are in the hallway at work talking. And this doesn't feel comfortable to him. So he flips to get at what is a comfortable body orientation. And what goes through my mind is he's just disengaged. He doesn't care about what I have to say. He's ignoring me. When in reality, he very well may be paying attention. He simply is moving to get it was a comfortable body orientation. So the best thing to do, whichever side of this you're on, the best thing for you to do is to stay planted. Because if you try to adjust, what will often happen is the person, other person, will often misread what that adjustment means. Thank you very much. Nice body work, Carrie. <laughs> now, let me also do one other thing in terms of nonverbal, and that is nods. 
even something as small as nods, men and women do differently. When women are listening to somebody, women nod. This nod means, I hear you, you've got the floor, keep on going. It does not necessarily mean, I agree with you. Men nod in agreement. So here's what happens. She goes in to talk to her male colleague about her great idea. As he's sitting there listening, he's not nodding. And she thinks, he's not listening. He doesn't care about what I have to say. He's just ignoring me. He's up in the ozone layer. When in reality, he very well may be listening, he simply doesn't agree yet. On the flip side, because there's always that flip side, he goes in to talk to his female colleague about his great idea. And as she's listening, she's nodding away like a dog in the back of the car. <laughs> and he's thinking she is buying this whole thing. They go to the meeting, and as one of my clients said about a lobbyist he used to work with, she would turn on me in the meetings. Well, when we talked about it, he realized that her, he misread her nod as agreement when in reality she was simply saying, I hear what you have to say, buddy. So even something as small as nods, we do differently. Now, what this all means is that successful organizations of the future are going to have leaders who are going to have team members who understand the rules of both cultures. As I said, this is not about goods or bads or rights or wrongs, but about these different invisible rules that we have. And what happens is, oftentimes we don't know. I was doing a workshop for a big six accounting firm, and there's this manager in there. I'd say he was in his mid-30s. And you could see, physically see the light bulb come on in his, in his mind. And he said, you mean if I lead everybody the same way, I'm leading some of them inappropriately? And I said, bingo, you got it. That we need to be able to change how we function as we go from culture to culture. As I always say, what it comes down to is it's all chopsticks and silverware. Whatever you grew up with seems intrinsically, obviously, the right way to do it. If you grew up eating with silverware, the first time you see people eat with sticks looks pretty weird. On the other hand, if you grew up eating with chopsticks, watching people stab and saw their food at the table <laughs> looks pretty weird. When both ways work just fine, it's being able to understand that both ways work just fine. And successful leaders and team members of the future will be able to use both sets of tools. Thank you very much. As he sees it, being a good team player means knowing your slot on the hierarchy and playing your slot well without question. To her, being a good team player means helping out anybody you can on this flat field in any way that you can. So then I went back to him and I said, how does her definition strike you? And he said, manipulative. I went to her and I said, how does his definition strike you? And she said, mindless. 